Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you. Uh, my name is Zahida, and I'm responsible for our standards activities at Google as part of the research organization um, reporting into Vint Cerf. So I'm um, very pleased to see um, a good crowd here. Um, just a quick question. How many of you have attended a standards talk in the past? So we've done some on HTML, C++, ECMA, um, not ECMA, sorry, ITF. OK, so a few hands, great. Um, so our role within the standards uh, group at Google is to really make it easier for Googlers to participate in standards, and also so that we know um, who's doing what within the organization. So that's really important. And then also our product teams um, to be connected with people um, like um, the gentleman up here today um, who are going to speak um, and the work that they're doing within the standards organizations and partly education on standards as well. So um, we have a website. If you type in go slash standards, that's where you'll find all the information that you need. And if, you, if there's anything there that you need to know, uh, please contact me, Zahida, at google.com. And um, without further ado, I'm going to forward, pass on to Mark Miller, and Mike Samuel, and Walter Mohorowitz for their presentation today, which is Changes to JavaScript. It's part of part one of a series. Thanks. All right, so uh, I'm Mark Miller. This is uh, Mike Samuel. This is Walter Mohorowitz. And um, uh, yeah, today we'll be talking about uh, changes to JavaScript. Um, uh, in this first talk, we're going to be talking about the imminent next version of JavaScript called ECMAScript 5. To place ECMAScript 5 in context, uh, let's uh, recap a bit of the history. Uh, the, the last official version of the JavaScript standard was ECMAScript 3 that was published in 1999. Uh, since then, there have been several attempts at feature-rich languages that have um, gone under the name ECMAScript 4. Uh, many very good ideas were invented in that context, but none of those uh, ever converged into general agreement across the committee. Then about two years ago, there was an, uh, a, a divergent effort to create a simpler successor language called ECMAScript 3.1. Um, and that attempt at simplification of, of putting um, fixing problems ahead of adding features uh, eventually got uh, committee-wide uh, consensus to become the next major version of JavaScript, and in so doing, got renamed ECMAScript 5. Uh, uh, implementations of this have been proceeding quickly. Uh, Internet Explorer and Mozilla Firefox uh, are about to release uh, feature-complete implementations as betas. Uh, there's also been progress at Opera, at our own V8, uh, not yet as far as we know at Safari. Uh, other activities in committee are a uh, working group in committee has been formed to standardize a secure variant of ECMAScript, as a, a secure subset of ECMAScript 5. Um, and uh, this effort is merging ideas from our own Kaha project, from the AdSafe project at Yahoo, um, from Jacaranda and Dojo Secure. Uh, and what we call the ECMAScript Harmony Agreement is an agreement across the committee uh, where we, we now have general agreement on what the future directions for ECMAScript should be after ECMAScript 5. And I'm pleased to report that from the general sense of that agreement, uh, I'm confident that JavaScript will continue to get better over time without becoming overly complicated. But today's talk is on ECMAScript 5 specifically. To understand the innovations of ECMAScript 5, we can organize them into three broad themes. And the first theme is to enable JavaScript library authors to be more on a par with JavaScript platform providers. So right now, the platform providers, in particular the browsers providing the DOM objects, the, the, these platform objects can have magical properties that cannot be emulated in JavaScript code. So JavaScript code, standard JavaScript code, cannot transparently emulate uh, the DOM objects, cannot be interposed be, uh, between other JavaScript code and DOM objects. We want to repair that. The second theme is to enable more robust programming. JavaScript was originally designed as a language for small-scale scripts 
for casual programming. It's proven to be a very good language for novice programmers. In fact, many people learn JavaScript as their first language. Um, but it's increasingly being used for very large scale serious programs whose robustness is important. And that's a load that JavaScript was not originally designed to bear and the strain is showing. So in our second theme, we're trying to make JavaScript a better platform for large scale serious programs without losing any of the friendliness that JavaScript has historically had for casual or novice programmers. And the third theme is, um, is in fact new features, new features that we're adding through new APIs. Uh, there have been several libraries that have uh, provided APIs that have shown themselves to be generally useful and popular, um, in particular the prototype library and the JSON library, uh, and ECMAScript 5 is promoting some of those well-proven features into becoming an official part of the JavaScript library to, to be provided directly by the platform. Of the things on the slide, there's one interesting puzzle, which is JavaScript has many inconsistencies, many warts and minefields that, that, that trip up both novices and experts. And we'll take you through some of these in the talk. Um, the puzzle is, how can we improve the language? Um, how can we remove some of these inconsistencies while still operating within the terrible, terrible legacy compatibility constraints that we necessarily have to operate in. So to answer this question, we need to understand what, it, what the legacy constraint really is. What is it that we need to be compatible with? It's not the letter of the ECMAScript, ECMAScript 3 spec because the letter of the ECMAScript 3 spec is not what browsers have actually implemented. They've implemented something close, but with some divergences. And the real constraint on any new spec is that it not break the web, that it be compatible with the trillions of existing web pages, the, the corpus of web pages that have been engineered to work across several of the major browsers. Um, so, the annoying differences between browsers that make writing cross-browser pages so difficult is ironically the, what opened up the opportunity for the committee to improve the language. Uh, what we were able to do is say only behavior that exists across browsers is behavior that the cross-browser web is, is constrained to be compatible with. So we could choose that rather than the letter of the ECMAScript 3 spec as the precedent. So we adopted in committee a rule of thumb called the three out of four browser rule. Um, uh, and uh, in addition, we, we tempered that with experience and common sense. Even with this, um, this realization, this still didn't give us enough room to improve the language, to, 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 make, to, to create a space for saner programming, for programming with, with, with fewer inconsistencies, um, because these compatibility constraints still caused us to include too many things that we would have liked to have removed. So we introduced one additional trick, which uh, came from um, the earlier uh, ES4 proposed spec, which historically derives from Perl, which is the notion of an opt-in use strict directive. Uh, the, the point of this directive is that um, with, it can declare that a certain body of code, the code within the scope of the directive, is to be considered strict code, meaning that the code should be interpreted according to the rules of a somewhat simpler and saner language. Um, so the changes from the overall language to the, to the strict sub-language are mostly subtractive. Um, this doesn't create a compatibility break because the old existing corpus of code on the web has not opted in. So none of the changes in strict mode break that corpus. For new code, um, uh, strict mode is, by, be, by having fewer irregularities, is better for both novices and experts. But there's still a compatibility constraint. We made strict mode sufficiently close to the overall language, the non-strict language, that code that's being maintained can port easily 
but with some work, can port easily from non-strict to strict. And that porting can be done in an incremental fashion. As you make parts of your program compatible with strict mode, you can, you can declare it so by putting the use strict directive on, and in so doing, incrementally gain the advantages of greater robustness and probably a, a small increase in performance. OK, so going to our first theme, um, putting uh, JavaScript uh, programmers more on a par with platform developers, what are these magical properties, this magical behavior that uh, platform objects have that JavaScript objects cannot? Uh, the first one it, we show by example with this assignment to a DOM object's inner HTML property. Uh, that assignment uh, in browsers actually causes I.O. It changes the DOM tree, which causes a different rendering to the user. Within standard JavaScript code, there's no way to create a property that reacts to assignment by engaging in activity. Um, uh, the second example of, of a magical property that the platform has that, that is currently denied to JavaScript programmers is shown within the my2String example. Uh, all existing JavaScript objects respond to the toString method, and the reason they do so is they inherit two string, the toString property from object.prototype. Um, so even though all objects have a toString property inherited from object.prototype, if you enumerate the properties of an object with a for in loop, uh, you won't see the toString property because it has a magic non-enumerability, which is this, this um, behavior of not showing up in for in loops. But if you want to divine your, d design your own convenience to live alongside object-prototype two toString, which is my toString, there's no way in existing JavaScript to define that convenience without having it show up in all of the four in loops that are running on your page. <clears throat> to address this first issue, which is um, having reading or assigning to properties cause activity to invoke, to, to run code, uh, Mozilla created what are called um, uh, act, what, what we're now calling accessor properties, which are properties that have getter and setter methods attached to them. Uh, the getter is what's run when you read the property. The setter is what's run when you assign to the property. So the, the value of the property and its response to assignment is, is, um, is now designed behaviorally according to the activity of those methods. Uh, other browsers, uh, several other browsers followed Mozilla's re lead, but with divergent semantics. Uh, ECMAScript 5 now um, codifies a uh, agreed semantics for getter setter properties and provides an API for, for defining them. The first way that getter setter properties are defined, access to properties are defined, uh, is by enhancing the object literal syntax. So over here we see an object literal for defining, uh, we're defining our own domoid object, which is an object intended to act like a DOM object. The, the first line within the object literal is the conventional object literal syntax. We're defining a property named foo whose value is the string bar. The second two lines together um, uh, show the new syntax where, where these two lines together are defining a property named inner HTML. The first line here, the get line, uh, defines the getter method. So that when you read the property, this code is run. Second line defines the setter method. When you assign to the property, the value assigned gets bound to this new HTML variable, and this setter code is run. Uh, you can also define these by an, an API that provides explicit control, as we'll get to later. On the magical behaviors of built-in properties, um, the way the ECMAScript 3 semantics accounts for that magical behavior is it describes the behavior of existing properties in terms of three Boolean attributes, which in the ECMAScript 3 language were called read only, don't enum, and don't delete. To avoid double negatives, we've renamed those writable, enumerable, and configurable. And configurable is a slight generalization of deletable, as we'll see. 
So although these are part of the ECMAScript 3 semantics, ECMAScript 3 doesn't provide any way to control these properties. Any new properties created by ECMAScript 3 code are necessarily writable, enumerable, and deletable. Uh, ECMAScript 5 provides a new API for controlling these properties. And this is that new API. Um, uh, over here we see a set of new static methods added to the object constructor. And we're going to start with the define property method. So if you say object.define property, the first argument is the object that you're defining a new property on. The next argument is the name of the property. And the third argument is an attribute description record. It's a record that describes um, not just what the value of the property should be, but what the settings are for its writable, enumerable, and configurable attribute. This is what the attribute description looks like for a normal data property. Later, we'll get to what the attribute description like, looks like for, a, for an accessor property. To use this to solve the my tree, yeah. Please note that uh, the, these things are defined on object.defined uh, property, not object.prototype.defined property. Uh, which is why you need to pass the object you're defining this thing on as the first parameter. Uh, so this is important for security reasons. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so over here, we're going to use define property to solve the my two string issue. So over here, we, de we define a non-enumerable my two string method by saying we're defining it on object.prototype. We're using the name. We're saying the name of the property is my two string. The value here would be the function that serves as the my2String method. And then over here, we provide the, the attribute settings where we provide enumerable false. So this for in loop here doesn't see my2String in the same way it doesn't see toString. The same API is used for, de for defining new accessor properties. Um, so over here, if we want to add uh, inner HTML as an accessor property to domoid after the fact, we do it by saying object.define property, but now our attribute description record, rather than having a value and writable field, has a get and a set field whose value is the, are the getter, the getter method and the setter method, respectively. So this is, in general, what the, what the attribute description record looks like for defining an accessor property. So this brings, up to, this brings us to the end of our first theme. Uh, what we've done to address this uh, issue of enabling JavaScript code to provide a practical emulation, not full emulation, but a practical emulation of the magical behaviors of built-in objects is property access control plus a standard way to create accessor properties uh, allows you, for example, to in JavaScript implement the standard DOM API, which is a good lit litmus test for solving the practical problem that we're, that we're solving here. Our next theme is making ECMAScript a more robust platform. So as mentioned earlier, the obvious problem is simply the, the accumulation of uh, traps and pitfalls, of, of, of minefields that trip, trip up both novices and experts. And smoothing those over, making the language uh, less irregular, is uh, certainly a, a major step towards robustness. But the problem is deeper than that. JavaScript was first designed um, with the, the, the style of usage that um, uh, of supporting the style of usage of everything can mess with everything. That was sort of the dominant style of usage that it was designed for. Uh, and that's fine for casual scripting, but um, it makes the kind of defensive programming that you want to write for creating large scale programs uh, essentially impossible. So for example, objects are just mutable maps of properties. Um, you can't lock down those properties. Anybody can mess with, with any property of any object they have access to. So the provider of an abstraction cannot defend the data invariance of the objects that they're building to provide the abstraction. And that means the clients of those objects can 
whether accidentally or maliciously, disrupt the invariance that the provider may have been counting on to provide some service. Another problem with defensive coding is some errors are silent. So for example, uh, if you assign to a read-only property, that assignment fails, but it fails silently. Execution simply proceeds forward on the control flow pathways that assumed success. This is impractical to defensively program against, because imagine trying to write a program or following every assignment, you try to write code that says, did this assignment really happen? No one's ever going to write code that way. They're just going to, to make the optimistic assumption that, well, it must have worked. Uh, and if it didn't, the disaster will, will proceed. Um, fortunately, the main tool in the toolbox of any language for, for writing defensive code is encapsulation. And JavaScript historically has had an almost perfect encapsulation mechanism, which is the JavaScript functions as a, a very good approximation of lambda abstraction. So a JavaScript function evaluates the lexical closure that encapsulates the variables that it captures. But even this construct is not quite a perfect encapsulation mechanism. It has some holes in it, as we'll see. And those are holes that we've addressed in ECMAScript 5. Um, and um, then finally, there's a particular pernicious form of error, which is toxic leaks of the global object. There's, certain, there's a certain kind of mistake that it's very easy for code to innocently, innocently fall into, and the consequence of which is that the global object accidentally gets smashed. And we've, we've tried to address that as well. So the way we've addressed the robustness has three elements to it. There's being able to make objects tamper-proof so that the provider of an abstraction can defend their invariance from their clients. Uh, so we've introduced this notion of you can seal or freeze an object. In this talk, we'll only be talking about freeze. Um, uh, and, and when you freeze an object, you really make it uh, tamper-proof in a, in, a, in a real sense. Um, uh, a style of programming that I would recommend uh, is that for the primordial objects, objects that are widely shared, like object.prototype and array.prototype, then any changes you do to those, you do in an initialization phase before your program starts running, and then to freeze those objects before the body of your program runs so that your, your program can now proceed with confident that those objects are not changing out from under you. The second element is this um, inconsistency reduction. Um, and then the third element is the introduction of strict code. So on this issue of, of tamper-proof objects, uh, what's an example of an invariant? Well, over here we see um, a very, very standard form of, con of JavaScript con constructor function. In this case, it constructs a point. You invoke this with new point, um, this dot x means assigned to the x instance variable of the newly constructed point. The x parameter as coerced to a number, the prefix unary plus operator coerces its argument to a number, and likewise for y. So the provider of this abstraction might have had in mind the invariant that both x and y be numbers, and the other methods on this object may be counting on that invariant. However, once a client of this creates a new point, that client can turn around and immediately just smash the, the X member with something that, that, that destroys the invariant. So to address this, <clears throat> we go back to our attribute control API, in this case, the freeze method. If you freeze an object, um, it does, uh, there's two changes that makes, to the, that makes to the object, and then it returns the object that you've frozen. The two changes that it makes is Every property of the object, it makes not writable and not configurable. Not writable means that assignments to the object's value will fail. Not configurable means that you can't delete the property. But as I mentioned before, it's a generalization don't, don't delete. When an object is not configurable, it also means that you can no longer change the, the object's attributes. So once the object is not writable and not configurable, 
that pro sorry that once the proper this property of an object is not not writable or configurable, then it's just locked down. Um, Freeze does one additional thing: is it makes the object non-extensible, so that you can't add new properties to it. Yeah. You can do, so yeah, freeze is just a convenience method. You can iterate through the properties and lock each of them down individually. And then there's another API call that I didn't actually show here called prevent extensions, where the only change it makes is to prevent new properties from being defined on the object. So if you do both of those things, you've done everything that freeze does. Um, yeah? Uh, is it, it's only completely frozen if it, freezes also all the values, because otherwise I could go in and change okay. the It's not values. transitively frozen. It's, okay. it's frozen only one level one deep. Level deep. Repeated yeah, I'm sorry. The question was, um, if you do that manually, you, you haven't frozen the values that are stored in the properties of the object. Uh, and does freeze, freeze those values as well, or does it only freeze the properties themselves? And the answer is, freeze only freezes the properties themselves. It's a shallow freeze, not a deep freeze. So, but you could do a deep, it now has enough power that you could do a deep freeze if you wanted to. Yes, but there's a subtlety there. Um, the subtlety is that you cannot traverse into the values captured by closures, since they're encapsulated. So what, so, uh, so what you can do is what we call a deep surface freeze. So it's, uh, we're mixing, it mixes metaphors terribly, but, um, but, but it's basically, you can freeze everything that you can find by traversing properties and traversing the prototype chain. So, so guys, just because we're recording this, if you could use the mic, or you need to repeat the question. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And any time I don't repeat the question, please remind me. Okay. So in order to use this to make tamper-proof points, uh, here's our first attempt at using this API to make a tamper-proof point, which is um, we use an object literal to just create a record with an x property, which is the x parameter coerced to a number, and the y property, which is the y parameter coerced to a number. And having created the record, we then, make, we then freeze the record to make it tamper-proof. This does create a tamper-proof point, but it has two problems compared to our previous piece of code. One is that these points are just records. They have no relationship to the point function, and they don't, so they don't inherit anything from point.prototype. The next problem is, is essentially the same problem in other guys, which is the newly constructed points, by virtue of not having any relationship to the point function, uh, if you ask, are they instances of point, the answer will be false. Often, for many objects that you're going to want to create, Neither of these is really a problem in practice. And when they're not a problem, this is actually the simplest pattern. So I recommend that you stick with this pattern. But when this, is not, when this pattern does not satisfy your needs, uh, here's a pattern that's completely correct and introduces another element of our new attribute control API, which is object.create. Object.create takes two parameters. The first one is the parent of the newly created object. The newly created object will directly inherit from this parent. So you say we want the newly created object to directly inherit from parent our prototype. And the second argument is an attribute map, a map of attribute descriptions. In this case, mapping from the name X to the attribute description record that describes what the behavior we want, to, to, we want to be associated with the x property and likewise for y. And then having created the new object, we freeze the object and we return the frozen object. So semantically, this does exactly what we want. It creates a proper point that's tamper-proof and inherits from point.prototype. Uh, uh, if you don't list the property, the default is false. Yes. Yes. So over, over here. Could you repeat that for the microphone, please? Yes. Uh, so um, over here in my property description records, the only attribute that I list is enumerable true. I didn't list all, all three attributes. Uh, for all the, when you're creating a property, for any attribute that you don't list, it defaults to false. If you're modifying a property, 
then for any attribute you don't list, it defaults to its, to its existing setting. It defaults to not changing it from its existing setting. So, so, so this is semantically completely correct, but, but uh, pragmatically, it has one problem, which is it's verbose boilerplate. It would just get very tedious to have to write this rather than the simple object constructor when you want to construct a new object. So the way you can address this, uh, just as, as an example, um, uh, is, is the way we always address boilerplate when we're programming, which is we, we create an abstraction that abstracts out what's common in the boilerplate, and we parameterize the abstraction with the part that's different from one use to, to the next. So we might, for example, add to function.prototype a build method that, is, is the, that abstracts out the boilerplate, but like adding my two string to object.prototype, we might want this new method not to disrupt four in loops that might be enumerating the properties of functions. So we want to add this new method effectively to all functions without showing up in all for loops. So we do exactly what we did with my two string. Is we use define property so that we can make it non-enumerable. This new method takes an attribute map as an argument, um, obtains the prototype of the function that it's invoked on, and passes that and the attribute map to create, freezes the, freezes the result, and returns it. Using that build method, we can now rewrite our point in so, that, so that it's both semantically correct as well as reasonably compact uh, and still creates a tamper-proof point. If you say point.build and then give exactly the same attribute map, uh, then it will use this attribute map to create an object that inherits from point.prototype. It will freeze that object and return it. So point here is a perfectly valid point, but, if you then, but because it's frozen, this attempt to assign to its X property will fail. Also, even though uh, we use this instead of the original construction pattern, this is not technically what, uh, what JavaScript uh, considers to be a constructor function. Notice that this does not mention this. Instead of initializing its this, it rather just constructs and returns a new object. And as a result of it having that behavior, uh, the new is harmless, but leaving the new out. If you forget to say new here, that's also harmless. It does, the new doesn't have any effect in this case. It'll always just create and return a new point. So uh, notice that this addresses uh, two out of uh, three uh, security issues uh, in that uh, you know, the points you create are instances of points and nobody can tamper with them, but this does not prevent somebody else from creating fake points, uh, which are also instances of points. Now that will have to wait until the next edition of ECMAScript. Yes, exactly. There's, there's um, <clears throat> that problem. Uh, was, there's no mechanism in ECMAScript 5 to, to fix uh, the problem that Waldemar just pointed out. Um, and it, it definitely is on the table after ECMAScript 5. So, um, so now we're on to the second element, which is uh, the inconsistency reduction. So, um, or, or the wart removal. The, on, on this section of the talk, I'm actually only going to talk through in detail one inconsistency, and for the sake of limited time, I'm going to skip over uh, the others. Um, so over here, we have a function named foo, defines an, a variable named x, and within that context, it, it creates a new function named baz that returns x, passes that to bar, and let's say that bar is just some function that, that invokes whatever function it's passed as an argument. What x, and, and let's say in the same program, somebody happened to define an a x property on object.prototype and initialized it with foo. In this case, what x does this return x refer to? Well, believe it or not, according to the letter of the ECMAScript 3 spec, the proper answer is that it should return foo because this x refers to that x. However, that was not intended by the authors of the ECMAScript 3 spec. It was, it was just a typo, not a typo, but it was, it was an editorial error in the way the ECMAScript spec was phrased. However, 
this error was actually implemented by some browsers and is a hazard that JavaScript programmers have to live with today. It actually caused a security hole at one point in Kaha. ECMAScript 5 is statically scoped where possible, so the answer is 8. So this is a good example of this issue of finding opportunity and confusion. That um, uh, when the ECMAScript spec didn't say what it meant to say, some browsers obeyed the letter, some obey, obeyed the saner spirit of the spec. The result is that cross-browser cross web content is generally compatible with that saner spirit, so the ECMAScript committee was, fr was free to adopt the saner spirit and codify that into the letter of the ECMAScript 5 spec. So I'm going to skip over the other examples of wart removal. Um, however, this talk will be online, so you can take a look at all those examples. And I, I'd say if, you're, you know, if this is your cup of tea, all of these examples are interesting. On to the subject of strict mode, which is the, 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 the main new tool that we've introduced here. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that when this assignment to the X property of point, if point is frozen, this assignment fails. But it fails how? Well, in ECMAScript 3, it fails silently. That silent failure is in four out of four browsers, existing web content counts on it. So ECMAScript 5, by default, the default ECMAScript 5 language couldn't change that. This is an example of a legacy problem that we could not fix in the normal language. But in the opt-in stricter language, we could fix it. So in code declared to be strict code, any assignments in that code that fail throw so that you're more likely to catch errors during development. And if you, even at, at, in deployment, if an error happens, it still takes your code out of the normal success control flow path onto the error path. So you can use try, catch, or whatever to, to implement failure recovery logic for, and in the worst case, for example, reload the page. How do you declare strict mode? You do it with this use strict directive, which is simply a string, string literal expression statement at the beginning of a program. By program, in the browser context, we mean a script block. You can have multiple script blocks on the same page, and some of them can be strict and some of them can be non-strict. These can coexist together perfectly well on the page. They're operating on common objects. Within a non-strict strict program, you can declare individual functions to be strict by putting the use strict directive at the, beginning of the at the beginning of the body of the function that declares the function itself to be a strict function. And we chose the strange syntax so that it still parses on ES3 so that while you're making the transition, while there's still existing browsers that you need to be compatible with, while you're also trying to take advantage of the new features, um, you can write code that works on both because this use strict directive will simply be taken by a no, as a no-op by the existing JavaScript language. It's simply a use, useless expression statement. OK, another example of a problem that we fix with strict, we can, that we can only fix in strict mode. Um, ECMAScript has some rules regarding the coercion of this. So returning back to our simple point constructor that initializes this, if it's written this way, it's only correct to call it with new. If you leave the new off, then you haven't provided an object for, to be bound to points this. So what JavaScript does by default is it binds this to the global object. What that means in the browser context is the window object. So what, what, what executes in effect is we, we've smashed the global x and y variables on the window object. In the case of x and y, it might be harmless, but if we intended to initialize a local instance variable named location, we would instead be redirecting window.location, which would redirect the page. If the, if the point function here is, is, is strict, then this is what gets executed in effect. Since no object was provided, this gets bound to undefined, just like absent parameters get bound to undefined. And this is safer, and in this case, the, the assignment to undefined.x will throw immediately indicating a problem. Here's another example of this coercion. Um, uh, true and false uh, both effectively inherit from boolean.prototype. If you add a method to boolean.prototype like this not method, 
uh, you can invoke it on both true and false. Um, uh, and what this not method does is it uses the logical not operator to return the logical negation of the object it's invoked on. So what would you expect this to do? Well, in non-strict code, true.not returns false and false.not returns false. And the reason is that false is coerced to an object by coercing to an object that's coerced to what's called the Boolean wrapper object. The not operator coerces its wrapper to a Boolean. Any object rather than a primitive value coerced to a Boolean gets coerced to true. The not of true is false. In strict code, there, there is no magical coercion of this. Therefore, there's no magic wrapping that happens behind your back for you to worry about if all your code is strict. And the result is that this code does what you expect. OK, I mentioned before functions are not encapsulated, uh, not quite encapsulated. So what's the encapsulation violation? <clears throat> Let's say we have a function named foo that has an x and a y parameter, and it calls the function named bar. And the function bar has this strange piece of code in it. Well, this strange piece of code actually is not sanctioned by any of the written down ECMAScript 3 specs. You're actually coding outside the spec. But once again, with regard to what we need to, be, to, to what the legacy compatibility problem we need to worry about, um, all of the major browsers implement these de facto magical methods. The one at stake here is foo.arguments. When bar accesses foo.arguments, it's accessing, accessing the argument property associated with the most recent activation of the foo function above it on the stack frame. That arguments object is joined to the parameters. Uh, the joining means that argument sub zero remains the same as the x parameter. So when bar accesses foo's arguments object and changes its zero to gotcha, then when it returns to foo, foo will proceed with its x parameter now bound mysteriously to gotcha. If foo is declared as strict, then even though these things are not sanctioned by any standard, in, in ES5 strict, there, we actually mandate that these exist and be useless, as well as mandating that this standard one exist and be useless. And by useless, we mandate further that their behavior is that they throw on access so that you can catch porting errors more easily when porting code to strict mode. So the result is that strict functions are safe even from non-strict code. Another problem with the, the language that we couldn't repair for the, for the language as a whole because existing web content counts on it is that uh, ECMAScript 5 is still not fully statically scoped. There's four violations of static scoping. The first one is that let's say you declare a local variable x foo and then you intend to assign to it, but you just misspell the variable when you assign to it. That misspelling causes a global variable of that name to be created. The with construct was borrowed from Pascal. In Pascal, it was a very nice idea uh, where you provide a record and then all the fields of the record can be accessed as variable names within the block. But because JavaScript objects have a dynamic set of properties, the semantics of accessing those properties from the block, the, the scoping semantics was bizarre. You could delete, dynamically delete a, a name from your static scope under some conditions. Uh, and by using a val, depending on what string is dynamically calculated to be a val here, if, it's, if it declares a top-level variable, that top-level variable declaration is exported into the scope that, that the eval itself is called from, causing you to dy dynamically add bindings to the caller's static scope. So the first three of these are rejected by strict mode, and the, and the, the fourth one is repaired by changing the rules around eval in, in strict code. Now, throughout the talk, I've been saying that ECMAScript 5 is statically scoped, I haven't been using the term lexical scoping. I wish I could. Uh, lexical scoping was on the table, but it was late for the train. Uh, we were not able to agree on how to specify lexical scoping uh, within the timetable in which we were finalizing the ECMAScript 5 spec. So what's the difference? Why is this a problem? So let's do that by example. Um, and I'll, I'll do this, and then I'll skip forward to the conclusion slide, uh, and then I'll take questions. So over here we have a function square, fun, square functions list. 
which given a list of numbers returns a corresponding list of functions um, and does that by looping through the, the list it was given and for each element of the list calculating the square and then storing into the results list a function that returns that square. So if you say square fin list of three, four, five, it get, that returns a list of three functions. The sub zero looks up the zeroth function, which we're now going to call. Um, anybody want to guess what this expression returns? Yes, somebody said 25. Very good. This returns 25. The reason is because of var hoisting. This declaration and, in, and initialization of the SQ variable is really semantically two completely separate things, the declaration and the initialization. And the declaration acts as if the declaration was hoisted to the beginning of the function. And the result is that this assignment here keeps reassigning to the same SQ variable. So even though we have really created three separate functions that we're storing in three separate elements of B, they're all capturing the same SQ variable. So when we invoke that first function, it's just going to return the last, the last value assigned to SQ. So we failed to get any lexical scoping constructs into ES5. That creates a real hazard for writing robust code. How do you cope? Well, this is a segue into the, the last theme of the talk, for which I'll just give this one example, um, which is so one of the new APIs that we added is these higher order array methods, which is if instead of writing a for loop, you say a dot map, in ES5, all arrays respond to map. And the way they do that is they invoke the function that you gave it as an argument to map on each successive element of the array. Whatever this function returns uh, is then accumulated by map into the result. So, so each of these new functions now has a brand new fresh SQ variable to capture. And this uh, returns nine as you'd expect. So in conclusion, ECMAScript 3, JavaScript in general, is, is, uh, you know, has always been a very decent language for, for small scale and casual programs. But even for, for the beginners, uh, there's too many odd corners, too many inconsistencies that can trip you up. Um, uh, the jewel here is ECMAScript 5 strict mode. Um, uh, it's a better language to teach for new code. It's uh, better language for scripting in the small, for casual and, and novice programmers. It's especially um, a better language for writing serious, large, robust programs. Um, I recommend strongly that any program being maintained be ported to strict mode once it's available. Uh, I would say, in fact, that ECMAScript 5 strict mode has crossed the threshold into actually being good. So, uh, so now we'll take questions. And I'll leave the, the further reading slide up as I do so. And why don't you guys join me for the questions? So um, when, when they moved from Python 2 to 3, part of the, that effort uh, critically depended on a tool called 2 to 3, which was an automatic transformation tool that uh, help people migrate. Will there be a similar tool for, let's say, three to five, or to strict mode that will help people to, uh, to migrate their old code? So uh, edition five uh, is meant to be you know, pushed into browsers. So uh, pretty much all existing scripts uh, of any consequence ought to work unchanged. Uh, now, for moving to strict mode, uh, we, I'm not aware of any such tools. Uh, but it should not be difficult to uh, convert uh, your scripts. I just don't know of any automatic way of doing it. You, you really have to understand uh, what it's doing or just run it in strict mode. If you get an exception, fix it and uh, try again. I, I would also point at uh, two existing tools that would help, uh, not for full ECMAScript 5 strict mode, because it doesn't have any recognition of the new features, but for, for sort of the strict subset of ECMAScript 3, which is Doug Crockford's JS Lint. If you get a clean bill of health from JS Lint, that's a good, a, a good step towards being compatible with strict mode. Uh, and similarly, uh, if your code works on Kaha, Kaha is trying to emulate, once again, the ECMAScript 3 subset of strict mode. 
So, in the, so prior to the browsers rolling this out, which should happen, by the way, very soon, you can still use Kaha to try to debug your strict mode conformance. Mike, please. That's very short. What's very soon? So the you know, final draft uh, uh, has been publicly available uh, for a month now. Uh, the, uh, the ECMAScript 5 will go up for the final vote of the General Assembly this December. And uh, browser vendors uh, other than Safari are working on implementing it now. Well, I can say in particular, Mozilla has said that they expect to have a, a beta of this available uh, within a month. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Internet Explorer, there's inter the, um, we're not sure when they're able to make it available, but they've been demoing it at the ECMAScript meetings, and they've, they've been saying that their implementation uh, internally is already mostly feature complete. In Sorry. Any information about Rhino's plan? Uh, I've talked to uh, Norris Boyd and Steve Yege. Um, uh, uh, there, there's currently uh, no work on that direction, uh, but... Um, uh, actually, this is Norris here uh, speaking. I don't know if you can hear me. They're enthusiastic about uh, oh, wanting to see progress in this direction. There's no current activity. What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what about Rhino? Oh, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we have a remote question. I could not. We could not hear it. Could you please repeat? Oh, hi. This is Norris Boyd. Um, we actually have a, a Google Summer of Code student that's working on um, doing ECMAScript uh, um, five in Rhino. So that work is uh, underway. It's like the um, Marshall McLuhan scene in Annie Hall. <laughs> I said, I, I talked about what Norris Boyd had said, and there's Norris Boyd. With object freezing, is there a way to achieve something like a private uh, property that my class can modify but others can't? Uh, no, there's not. Uh, the way you achieve the equivalent of private properties is by using the one encapsulation mechanism that JavaScript has always had. Uh, it remains the one encapsulation mechanism that's there in ES5, which is lexical closures. So uh, there's a particular pattern which Doug Crockford has pioneered called the objects as closure pattern, where in your constructor function, you create um, methods per instance that capture, where the methods are simply defined in a scope where the instance variables are available as variables, not as properties. But uh, ECMAScript 5 has, has no ability to create private properties uh, we've talked about um, uh, various uh, forms of private properties for later versions of ECMAScript, and there's a, there's a particular way of doing that that I expect uh, uh, will be adopted, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. Yeah. One, one of the issues we're discussing is whether a private uh, ought to mean uh, private to an object or private to a class, and currently there is not much agreement in the committee about which one to go with for, in the, for the future. Hi. Um, maybe like 10 slides ago, you guys were talking about um, an object define property function that was going to like be a first class uh, method. Um, could we just go back to that slide? I just wanted to ask a question about it. Um, basically, it refers the question is about uh, compilation of uh, JavaScript or like minification of JavaScript. Um, sh maybe go back to the the other slide that was just about defined property. Um, this one here. Okay. Um, okay, so the first parameter is the prototype that you want to modify. Uh, the second parameter is a string version of the method or, or what have you. I think this is going to be difficult to implement in a compiler. Um, I've seen this, this pattern in uh, Clojure, for example, in, in the testing libraries. Um, if you wanted to dynamically rename my to string to some small method name like a, um, you'd have to special case this function here to also determine that this is the same function and rename it appropriately. Um, is there, and I think this, 
this pattern is going to be duplicated all over the place once ECMA 5 hits. Um, you, well, you have the same issue if anybody ever uses square brackets in your program. So could you, uh, could you introduce something like a name object where that way the name object can be aliased um, and you could recognize that, that, in fact, it is a name object. And since it, uh, if the name object then course to a string, which was the name, then you could pass the name object in and, uh, and just let the, uh, let the interpreter course it to a string as it gets passed to the underlying you know, defined property. OK. Um, before speaking, before speaking much more about the compiler technology you have in yeah. mind, I, I just want to, to remind everybody, uh, this is a public talk. Right. OK. Great. Um, so just uh, crap. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I wanted to say um, uh, on the uh, objects as closures pattern, uh, we've, there's, uh, Ehab put, did some work to determine to prove that uh, if you do ha if you are creating a method per instance in the constructor, uh, it's possible for interpreters to optimize that so you're not getting um, uh, o number of methods per uh, object uh, instantiation. Hello, I was wondering if there's a document anywhere that describes what uh, in particular was borrowed from. JS Lint and various libraries, because it'd be nice to see for the libraries we've been using which pieces have come in and how they're interpreted and uh, something like that. Is there a document like that? It's, uh, I mean, the evolution of uh, edition five is uh, kind of complicated. It's, it has not really evolved from existing libraries with the exception of JSON, uh, rather and, it's- And, uh, and prototype. Uh, and, and some prototype, but m most of the ideas were just uh, formed within the committee based on our past experience. So. Yeah, in particular, from the from the prototype library, Soul. the our, the generic the higher order array methods, and also function dot prototype dot bind. Can you hear me? But, uh, th th things like uh, the getters and setters came from ES4, and so. Uh, it's, everything has a long and rich history. If you go to www.ecmascript.org, you can see some of it. Yeah. I'm sorry, we had a remote question? Yes, John from New York. Um, presumably, you can also solve the var hoisting problem by inserting uh, function literals that are immediately called. That also works? Great. Uh, no, you can't because uh, then this break, continue, and return will not do what you want. Uh, it's, uh, we've discussed this a lot. Uh, in the next edition, we are thinking of introducing a let statement, which is a lexically scoped version of var. Well, there will be a, maybe a let and a const, because const does not work with hoisting. As a matter of fact, I have a slide here that we, one of those that we'd skipped over. Um, which is, these are all of the things that break if you simply uh, replace a block with a function surrounding the block that you then immediately call. So return break, continue, this arguments var and function all break if they appear in here. However, um, uh, when you're aware of this issue, you can generally avoid most of these problems. The only one that, that really practically trips up most programmers is the this problem, which is fixed by uh, function prototype bind. Probably easier to actually list the keyword to continue to work. So I think no. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Thank you very much.